Yeah, that's, I'll try that's... and not let it bother me. I start slowing down talking every time. Every time. My wife and I were testing it like a month ago, and it was the same deal. Okay. <laughs> I started talking to her, and I was going like this, and then I would crack up laughing, and I just couldn't stop. <laughs> You know, uh, one thing that you might consider, I'm not sure if it will help, uh, it's mixed results. If you have a metronome going, okay. then then you might you might be able to just see and keep that, keep whatever rhythm you have going. And at, as it speeds up, you realize you have to speed up. Also. You can also take one ear off. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. <laughs> so Gary, Barasa. Borasa. Borasa. Yes. So thanks for coming. Thanks for fencing me. Oh, you're it quite well. Blast. Uh, long sword, tomahawk and bowie, and then rapier. foil and first rapier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your background? Tell us about. You've been in the SCA for over twenty years. Um. Well, definitely over twenty years. Okay. Uh, actually, I got in about. It was eighty-one or eighty-two. I think it's eighty-one. Okay. So that puts it to about, um, well, pushing 40. Oh, my gosh. So I actually probably 36 years. Nice. Okay. And I, I feel like you had told me that before, but I felt like it was just funny. I couldn't remember why. Well, anyone listening to this is not going to be party to that other conversation. So Absolutely. Uh, tell us about the SCA. What, what first drew you in? You were a young man. Uh, well, what drew me in was actually uh, my desire to my my emotions and desire to I've had it I'm going to start a sword fighting organization I'm going to do this okay. and then there was a uh, actually a Smithsonian Institution magazine article on uh, the SCA okay so I decided okay this exists go find it and I found the uh, uh, the SCA, uh, Society for Creative Anachronism, doing a demonstration at the Holly Renaissance Festival. Okay, yeah. So I went there, found them, uh, found the Lansing group, started uh, attending, started, okay, I want to learn how to fight with swords. Okay, Keep going. first you need armor. Okay, where do I find the armor? Well, you can't just find it off the shelf somewhere. Uh, we have to make our armor or have it made, stuff like that. Uh, so I made my own helmet. Uh, you started heavy. I started into heavy. Which and how is, old were you? Um, let's see, I would have been about uh, approximately, uh, that's approximately a very good question, um, about 22, 23, somewhere around. Uh, so and you had no prior experience with fencing or sword fighting at all? None. Okay. Uh, I had searched for more uh, collegiate and Olympic styles, but in uh, in Flint, Michigan, there was precious little to be found. Okay. So made your own helm. Made my own helm. Group. Uh, my own everything, actually. Right. Uh, made a uh, helm, shield, um sword you'd have to get rattan that you have to buy okay now you've got it now you have to make your own hilt any any pummel whatever uh and then was off and running so was heavy pretty much it at this time at this time that in was the SCA. it okay. in the sca there was only heavy weapons and there would be only heavy weapons for the next uh oh 15 years <clears throat> I like it. Hmm. I, I haven't done much. I fenced heavy one time with Steve. And you and I haven't, unless you count longsword, but not really. No. No. Yeah. I'm amazed at how those guys go at it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's impressive. It's full tilt, and they don't hold back at all. So how, you're not doing that much. Is there no. a reason? Um. Yes, I, I decided that I I did not have the willingness willingness to make people take my shots. Mm -hmm. And if you if you were not at a particular level, then you were considered you know more or less nothing. Okay, but that's also part of SCA culture. Um, it's 
Well, an unfortunate part of SCA culture. I think it's actually a part of human nature. Okay. Um, are, are you part of us? Are you one of the others? Okay, if you're an other, okay, you're, you're one of the little people I don't have to uh, acknowledge you or whatever. Um, and once you get, if you, if you view all of humanity in that, okay, fine. Now let's take a subset. Even within that other subset, you're going to have those gradations mm -hmm. of, are, are you part of the cool kids? Are mm -hmm. you not? And, and that's the same with many, many people. Um, I, I try not to do that. And, uh, but there's so much more to the SCA than just heavy combat and combat sports. There's it, a huge amount. It is a culture. Oh, yes. And I, I haven't met too many people, but I've listened to some podcasts from people who are talking about what the SCA is and their involvement in it. <clears throat> it's not my personal experience, but a lot of people are seeming to be getting out of it at this time. Is that something that you've seen? Or is that just an ebb and flow over the years of people who they get in, they get out? Well, there's, there's going to be a natural ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many people that say um a couple let's say a uh, guy and a girl get together they get married they have kids um and it's great going to events and participating in tournaments and all the arts and dance and whatever else um and then the kids get to be a little too much and develop their own lives and the parents support them they get away for a while and after the kids are gone away they look in the closet and like hey i haven't done this i wonder if it's still going on they come back yeah so there sure. there is very much an ebb and flow and uh or or there will be people that okay yes i'm very involved in this and now i've enlisted i'm going away and forgetting about the sea for four years eight years 12 years 20 years uh, mm -hmm. one friend of mine has retired as a colonel, so now he's getting back into everything. Uh, so that's that's what's going on. And some people, you know, have with the as the economy rises and falls, yeah, their involvement <laughs> uh, can lessen too. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me more about because I don't know too much besides just the sword fighting aspect of the SCA. I've only been to the sword practices, and that's been the limit of my involvement how how deep were you in sca what kind of stuff were you involved in um well there there have been various plans of, of various projects i mean if if you're male you tend to be project oriented mm -hmm. and want to take on this project or that and you know i i have the bones at home where i can start sawing up these moose bones and start carving my own eyeglasses or at least the frames okay. for eyeglasses you know you you could get into it in that detail and yeah. do all the research um a lot of sea organizations tend to be centered around universities and that's great because you have all this ready-made research in yeah. a variety of things so and you try to recreate that you say okay does this scholarly interpretation really work in real life so I mean, with, within range of us speaking, there's someone who has a medieval-style beehive. Yeah. And they're, they're going to take the honey, and they're going to um, get that out of there, start cooking up a batch of mead, and yes. uh, do all of that. Uh, that. That same woman who is doing that uh, decided that she would do the same thing for fishing, the actual okay. period fishing. Okay. with uh, bone hooks and everything like that. So it seems a little difficult. <laughs> uh, it is, and that can be involved, but there are some people who take it to that extent and others that, okay, I get to wear a costume and hang out with friends. And it's, it, it's that range. You know, you can have mm -hmm. a costumed coffee clutch, as some, some people understand it to be, and then you can have a really intensive recreation of nearly all aspects of medieval life yeah um, my wife is fond of researching medieval medicine okay and uh and 
you know, thinks, oh, this is this is great. They have this one particular thing right, but I'm still not going to tape an amethyst to my forehead <laughs> if I have a headache. So, you know, you, it that in the Middle Ages they got some things really right on that were only now and some able. Things really, really wrong. <laughs> and, and, and blazingly wrong. Yes. yes. Yeah. George Washington. I mean, it's not medieval, but bloodletting. Like, oh, yes. Gosh. Or putting, licking a frog for the warts. I don't know. All kind um, of, I'm, I have newt. I'm not a, a frog licker. No. I, I don't <laughs> think I'll do that. It's probably for the best. For yes. the frog as well as for you. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I've gotten into mead making and various projects, wow. costuming. Have you kept your own bees? Uh, no, 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 I have not. Um, Doesn't that get expensive for the honey? I looked into making mead. I desperately want to make it. Well, there is going to the store uh, mm -hmm. to and buying honey retail. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you know, getting to know beekeepers mm -hmm. and helping them with the harvest and yeah. slipping them some money and walking away with a five gallon bucket. So, you know, it depends on what, uh, what you can, uh, what you can do, what you can scare up. Yeah. Fair enough. So what was that process like? Uh, harvesting honey? No. Making mead. Oh, making mead. Um, we were at Holly last year for the Ren Fair. Mm -hmm. We did the, the Royal Ball and they had some spiced mead stuff uh, it was it, fantastic stuff <laughs> it can be it mm -hmm. can be um well the mead making process um you take a certain amount of honey you take water mm -hmm. you boil it okay and um you you are to boil it until the scum rises riseth to the top okay and you skim that off and uh you do anything with it throw it away no i i throw away the scum i'm not okay. sure of anything uh essentially that's uh proteins that are are left from the the honey uh and then you let it cool somewhat you throw in some yeast you throw in some flavorings if they're sterile or you put in flavorings during the boiling process so that they're sterile what kind of yeast did you use i i like montroche um and that's that's a that's the brand um no i th i i believe no it's one of the dry yeasts okay. but it is uh it is a variety of dry yeast okay uh i have never gotten into liquid yeasts and they i do know that they are more a pure strain and if you've got a dry yeast there are the chances that wild yeasts have introduced themselves okay. so if you're if you're trying to do a viable commercial operation on a large scale you want to go with liquid yeast and if you're doing stuff at home, it's worth the risk. Just go dry. Okay. So, but then you uh, you take that, you um, you let the yeast work. Uh, that could be anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And then you uh, you rack that off from the the yeast that has died a very happy death. Mm -hmm. And uh, you bottle it and age it for however long you're going to. And how age long it for. is mead supposed to age? Uh, there are people who will crack it open as soon as possible after a few weeks. Okay. I find that a mead has not really fully matured until about four years. Okay. So I've got. I don't know where it went. There's a growler around here somewhere. It's full of Concord grape juice. Okay. And I can't remember the yeast that I used. Uh, but it was a high yield, high mm. content yeast. It's been in there for about two years. I haven't re-racked it yet. So oh all that yeast is at the bottom. I'm afraid it's going to just turn into Concord wine vinegar. There is Either always way. that danger. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you've got something nice to cook with. Yep, absolutely. That's what I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm. So we've got cheese, bread making, meat making. Everybody's making their own armor, dresses. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's kept you in the SCA all this long? Ah, uh, friends. Yeah, I, there's there's a lot of who who can you talk to about shop about swords? You know, talk yeah, shop about absolutely. swords. It's it's a fantastic thing. Um, once you start fighting with swords, it's really difficult to stop. It's <laughs> it's addicting in some ways, but 
it's a never ending process of learning and the amount of weapons that you can learn from the people that you can learn from there's always something new Mm -hmm. so what are some of your favorite weapons you started out doing sword and shield that's all what i i started out with a a rattan sword Mm -hmm. and a three quarter inch plywood shield okay uh and mine was lighter than most i used a 20 inch round uh and uh well eventually the uh the rapier came in Mm -hmm. and we were using epes Uh, i actually used a heavier repe i used a musketeer epe uh which is double wide okay and some people will at at the time were saying oh no those are are blazingly too horrible to hit something with and then came along the schlager blade uh Hmm. which were much heavier yeah um but actually a mechanical advantage to longevity other than an epe, which is a epe being V configuration. Right. Only reliably bends in one direction. You bend it in the other. Okay, now you've got micro fractures mm-hmm. and the uh, the longevity of the blade is now greatly shortened. Where a Schlager blade or or any kind of flat cross section blade is going to bend both ways have a little more life to it oh yes a lot more okay and that came in around what year how long have you been in when that started um well i came in when uh, it was a single yeah when um epes had come in and we were actually using some foil blades for daggers because there were no options Mm -hmm. Uh, we created a market for manufacturing daggers uh the sca did uh, but this and, is a move more to include renaissance time period because well, foils and rapiers that's not medieval no no it's it's not well it depends on how you classify medieval okay and uh there are certain origins where they did have thinner blades okay but also when you're speaking about a rapier a lot of SEA rapiers are, um, they, they, they're still a little too small than other more accurate historical rapiers. It's, okay. And, and as soon as you say anything medieval, you're yes. talking about a thousand years. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, and, quite a period of time and, and worldwide. Yes. So you really need to get into specificity mm-hmm. and say, okay, they used this one thing at this time and right. this place and did anybody else know about it and yeah. that may be no right and you and we have this historical example because um someone threw it in a closet after being laughed at <laughs> so, which which is a, a real concern uh, yeah. because you you only get clues from history and since everyone from there is dead long ago you don't know the the actual place that it had in life whether it was rejected whether it was such a good idea that they were all used up okay. a, a sword is is pretty ablative you're you're not going to have a sword last that long it's going to be in continual it's going combat to be used. yeah so but but anyway this this started for what is my favorite sparring yes thing? uh it's it has always been rapier okay uh i am uh thanks thanks to hema coming around mm-hmm. uh getting more exposure into the better um we were just fencing with uh tomahawk and bowie knife uh, that that's all nice i i would like to do much much more with the better but it, before that really happens um rapier is what i prefer okay and how come um I get to wear less. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so there you are. Much less injury prone. You are much less injury prone, uh, and you you don't if you're fencing with sane people, you don't need all the armor. Good and luck. If, yeah. Well, that there is there are some problems there too. Yes, absolutely. Um, but also, you uh, you you have a culture where the rapier existed and it was a shirt sleeve culture shirt sleeve 
a shirt sleeve culture. You're you're out there. You have a rapier. You're there at the tavern. Okay. If somebody messes with you. Ah. You may have a duel. Yes. Or you've been there at the tavern. You're a little tipsy. Somebody wants your money. Yeah. So you are going to be defending yourself in shirt sleeves. Okay. Uh, so keeping the armor down is going to be a more faithful reproduction of uh, the life that you're going to have with a rapier. Because if you're going into battle, chances are you're not necessarily, and, and there are some historical deviations with the, where they actually did, but if you're going into warfare, you're not going to have a rapier. Right. You may have a side sword and And that's your pike. backup. Yeah. Yeah. Pikes and muskets definitely ruling the day. Well, at one point, right, right. before then it was pikes and uh and crossbows. Right. So it, yeah. it all depends. Uh, the history of going from one stage of technological warfare to the next, to the next, to the next. Mm. Very interesting. The loss of armor moving towards clockwork flintlock mm. interesting times <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing uh you know you you've got the the snap hands well you've got the match to snap hands yeah. to flintlock to percussion to center fire mm -hmm. and and we're still using center fire we haven't got a magnetic ignition yet yes but you know there, <laughs> no goss rifles exists. at the moment. it no, does well, it's incredibly expensive yes so i don't own one but <laughs> I do believe the United States Navy has put a Gauss cannon on the on one of their destroyers. They do. Yep. Uh, Have you they, heard of that? Oh yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. very much. And it has been successful. Okay. Much more successful than duct taping a uh, uh, a Hellfire missile to a Coast Guard <laughs> cutter. But I would know nothing of this. Would all. you? No, not no. I. Sitting here, I know nothing about that. You know a little bit. I, I do know that if you, you fire had a to, missile yeah. from a Coast Guard cutter, a nice white one, mm -hmm. it's no longer white on one no. side. <laughs> so. Fair enough. See, I don't know. You seem to have a little more of knowledge, but... Well, I can deny it, too. So. Fair enough. Plausible deniability. Yeah, so rapier is your favorite. Rapier yes. and a parrying dagger, or just straight rapier? Um, there, I, have, I, I prefer rapier and dagger. Okay. I really do. Um, but I'll also get out with case of rapier. Yeah. And that's that's a blast. That's a lot of fun. Um, and switching back from case to rapier and dagger is sometimes it causes you a quick heart attack when you would have had that wonderful thrust with your your the offhand. offhand yeah sword and now it's dagger and you're six inches short um, more um, than six inches could be well yeah it, it depends on how much you've extended right so uh yeah so tell me about the differences in fighting for survivability and so much of what we do is pretend combat you know oh, we are it's... we are dueling with a lot of protective gear and as we should because we don't want to hurt each other but how much of that takes away from the experience, in um, your opinion? Well, I, if if you have a look at it and you're really honest, mm -hmm. the natural evolution of the uh, of the sword is the machine gun, mm -hmm. and you you are wearing a flak jacket or an armored jacket, and you're wearing a Kevlar helmet. Though that's the natural evolution of a sword. It's a weapon of war. You take that all all the way and there you go and mm -hmm. uh there there is no fight club for swords uh, so well, you're tell me what you mean okay well you're you're never going to find a place or or certainly no place that i know of where you're going to face off against someone with a sword with the intent to kill them at least not in this modern day not in, in this, this modern first day. world no however Country. since you know, if, if someone says this with enough money, you have the most dangerous game with swords now. Mm -hmm. um, and and that'll be done way far away from people. No one will reliably know. Like, no one will reliably know that you have to re-chemically treat the side of any Coast Guard cutter to make it white again. <laughs> Fair enough. But you seem to know. I, 
I really don't. Well, it's not. All right. It's only a blind <laughs> estimation on my part. Understandable. I have a lot and of blind estimations. Tell but, me another you know. blind estimation. Oh dear, no. Um, that would be bad. Okay. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, rapier and dagger. Oh, well, back to the survivability. Okay. Um, it, the I, I do I do like civility. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of civility with swordsmanship. Uh, you are not trying to uh, kill someone or kill someone to save your own life. Uh, we don't have that, so you're not going to go all out mm -hmm. in in a very happy marine kind of way in um, some ways i want to disagree with you because in heavy with the sca especially fighting steve dean goodness gracious i felt like i had to defend my life fighting against that guy oh and if if uh if he wanted to and he's also known as sir stefan sir stefan absolutely uh, if he really wanted to kill you um he would have a backup dagger and you'd be on the ground and he's forcing the dagger through your eye slots uh, so there is an amount of civility there. Mm -hmm. um, yet there's still rules. Yes. And since there are rules, even in SCA heavy. Yes. Oh yeah. There's there's a bundle of rules. Especially in SCA heavy. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you weren't hit uh, at the <clears throat> knee or below. Right. And that's part of their part of the rule system. Okay. And you're not thrown to the ground. Mm -hmm. That's part of the rule system. So you, you're not going to be fighting for survival. I mean, you're going to have, if you're fencing him, uh, you're going to have a big job ahead of you. Yes. But uh, you're, you're, still, you're still not fighting for your life. Thankfully. <laughs> yes. Okay, so getting into your favorite weapons, moving away from the survivability. You know, how did you come to... I'm losing track of my thoughts. <laughs> I wrote down your thoughts. Here okay. we go. Choose one. I don't know. I'll choose one. You can ask me a question. All kinds of stuff's going on around here. Sparring and free fighting. Yeah, I wrote a post on that, on the HEMA Alliance. I think you saw that. I'm asking questions about, like, as I'm coaching, I want my students to be able to spar with me. What's the difference, in your opinion, for sparring and free fighting? Um, I, I really, this may be the, the question that I have the, uh, the least on. Okay. I, I don't see that there is really a difference. I, you, you could have different kinds of sparring where you're calling out, yeah, I got hit here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's fencing till you get a kill and then you reset. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's just going at it. Uh, for which is a nice exercise for endurance mm -hmm. uh and then you may at some random point uh call a break in things now if i saw a lot of people posting that sparring had a very specific definition for them and they were saying sparring was if you have a specific skill level if you're the coach or even if you are two students sparring their word for sparring was specifically trying out new techniques they weren't free fighting i feel like those two words are interchangeable sparring and free fighting are very similar to me they were saying sparring is only for as a coach i'm training you i'm limiting myself in everything that i'm doing so that as we're going i'm teaching you it didn't feel right to me Sparring and free fighting, they seem to be very interchangeable. As the coach, I need to limit my moves, my aggressiveness with a new student. But as that student grows in maturity, as they grow in skill, uh, it becomes much more of a free fight. And it's sparring all the same to me. I, w I would agree. Okay. I, I don't think there's really reasonably, reliably a difference in between the two. Obviously, there's going to be some people who differ but if if you're going into sparring with the idea of you're going to try something specific why can't you be doing that as you're free fighting yeah uh, why can't you be doing that with 
every encounter that you're doing. Um, so I, I do see that there is a big problem with saying this can only include this. And okay. That. <laughs> Speak a little more on that because there's a lot of that going on. And I'm sure that that's been going on for a long time, even in the SCA. I keep mentioning the SCA only because I know that that's been your background for a very long time. Hmm. When did HEMA come around? Oh, well, for HEMA's, you. Okay, for me, mm -hmm. uh, for me, HEMA started with Barditsu. Okay. Uh, I found that there was a local Barditsu group uh, or Barditsu. So this has got to be fairly recently because Chris is the one doing the Barditsu. Yes. Okay. Uh, it, it happened a couple of years ago okay. or so, approximately that. Uh, but there is it. Barditsu was the, you know, and and you can argue one way or another on this. Uh, one of the original mixed martial arts, yeah. Because uh, Miss, Mr. Bart decided to have a school and include some jujitsu and cane fighting mm -hmm. and some pugilism and boxing and uh just a a, a several things and, and what time period is this just for people listening this is in the 1890s okay. and for not that very long in the 1890s um there was i believe hutton might have also had saber in the school um uh, but it, it was it, it seemed to be much less a regimented mixed martial art that included these specific things and more this is a club and hey i've just invited this instructor to do this and he's going to be here and then after that we'll have this included in what we do so do you think it was more practical self-defense oriented or was it more people just hanging out, having fun together, learning these skills to enjoy the skills. This this was self-defense. From the, this yeah, was from a the pictures I've art. seen, it's definitely more of a self-defense. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, it was because you had, um, it, it was rough in East the Victorian Coast. age. East Coast, okay. London, okay. docks of London, mm. along the Thames. Um, you had business to do. If you looked like a wealthy enough target, you were a big target. And you know, how do you how do you defend yourself? Yeah, too many guys were playing billiards and drinking and not learning how to fight. <laughs> there there is that. Okay. Um uh, but so you you have a walking stick and mm -hmm. that's great. But you learn that okay, this walking stick can be used for self defense. Get a bigger one with a larger head. Now mm -hmm. you've got a walking stick that is still a walking stick, but it will defend your life. I think I showed you mine, didn't I? In, uh, I'm uh, not sure. I'll show you again. Yeah, I got a walking stick with a copper horse head. Oh, it's pretty okay. sweet. Very I'll nice. Show it to you. <laughs> mine, mine has a, a nice brass knob mm -hmm. that I use on occasion when brass, I, of course, need need a little little more because I'm an old injured guy mm -hmm. and I know that there's going to be a little bit of trouble, so. I'll need my walking stick. One of these days, I'm sure I'll need it too. Mm -hmm. Somebody was telling me at work, it's not the injuries they get you, it's the mileage. It is the mileage. Okay. You'll recover from individual injuries just fine. Okay. It's <laughs> when you have injury after injury mm. that, yeah, it's, it takes a toll. I'm going to have a toll. There will be a reckoning for me. I know. Yes. You got me on the thumb. Oh, sorry about it's that. It's all good. My hockey gloves are just not enough. It's on the side. Mm. It's on the side. There's no padding on the side of my hockey gloves. Okay, you need to invest in some lacrosse gloves. It's... They are well, they're lacrosse. They are lacrosse, not hockey. Oh, okay. But there's still no padding on the sides, just the tops. Mm. It's my own fault. They were cheap. Okay. It is what it is. It's affordability can kill you. Yes, I'll make my own. I've got to start. <laughs> Yay! It's a good thing. Yeah. So you started in Bar you started doing Baritsu. Baritsu. This was just a couple years ago, and that's moved you into HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. Yes. And this is treaties and manuals written from all periods, medieval, Renaissance, and as we said, Renaissance or medieval being a thousand years of history. Oh yes. In the SCA, 
they study treaties as well? Um, they 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 really didn't. Okay. Um, it was all it was all uh, well. The first tournament was because someone had someone in Berkeley, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, UC, this is where it started, right? UC Berkeley is where okay. the SCA started in the and '60s or the '70s. It was in it was in the '60s. Okay, or, or it was just as we get to the '70s, somewhere in there. And um, the instructor for this medieval literature class said, "And the last tourney was in fifteen something." And uh, these kids in the class decided, "Hey." We're going to do that tourney. <laughs> we're going to do the next tourney. That's and, awesome. And they, if they like, the the week after went to the, uh, the instructor and said, you know how you said the last tourney was at this year? Well, we did one this last weekend and described it to him. It's like, okay. But, and there the it goes. The last tourney was last weekend. That's awesome. And, yeah, and it caught on and mm-hmm. it kept going. Uh, but. I, I think it was an all from scratch kind of thing. Yeah. And many things, many techniques were in just plain invented and there was no basis for it in uh, actual medieval combat. It's whatever menu. works. Yeah. It's whatever works, works. Mm-hmm. And that that's an, more an adage from U.S. Special Forces, from people who were um, – Killing people and breaking things. Mm-hmm. Whatever works, works. Mm-hmm. And the SCA, you know, you have a sword. Well, form follows function. Mm-hmm. Even you have a long thing. It might be wood. It might be metal. You're going to use this as a long thing. Yeah. And you've got a certain amount of armor. You've got a shield or not or something else. The form will follow function. So you go to these combat manuals and you can take your background in the SCA and okay here's several things that you could add to that Uh, some people have a look at a uh, medieval manuscript and think this is the entire sword art there are problems this manual only yeah doing this manual only there is only this and that's I've seen that yeah I've seen that problem in HEMA especially Mm -hmm. where a club or a coach will latch on to a single manuscript Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah. That's a big mistake. Okay. Um, and you know, I can, I can draw much, much farther back and take a look at, uh, ancient Rome, Republican Rome and Mm -hmm. okay. They come up with, you know, Marion comes up with the Marian reforms for the Roman army. And that's great. And we know exactly what the Marian reforms are were but can you speak on that i I don't i don't know anything about it i didn't know that there were manuals from the roman empire well no there were the marian reforms and the the reforms stated that no we're going to do this now and that now and the other now but we don't know what came beforehand and that's that that's kind of the root of the whole problem when you don't know what came before you uh you, you can't take a look at the, now we're doing this, that are very specific things. And everything that is in between, you, you have no clue. You don't know what they reformed from, so you don't know the significance of the reforms. Okay. Uh, and the things with various, various manuals, uh, you, the manuals tend to give you some tricks. Uh, we could talk about the Meyer Manual, mm-hmm. which is, I, if you read, faithfully read the introduction, this is sport fencing. Okay. And telling you how to do sport fencing. I, it's, his manual is produced where you don't have a lot of long swords on the battlefield. You might have a few, but you've got pikes, you've got firearms, you might have some holdover crossbows. But Meyer goes over. He doesn't go over crossbows and firearms, but he does longsword, dusak, rapier, and dagger, and pike. Mm-hmm. Well, the pike is going to be the most uh, the most valuable thing mm-hmm. to any fighting man. Uh, because you're... Especially in formation in oh, yes. a battle scenario. 
yeah, you're you're going to have to be have with to. a pike. You have to be in a battle formation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a side sword, the dusak is going to be very valuable for you. Uh, and if that breaks on you or somebody wrenches it out of your hand, you need to grab your dagger. Right. But the long sword that so many people latch onto for Meyer, okay, they're not using that anymore. And if they are using that, they're going to use it as a half sword for a spear. They're going to use... Are you talking in a, about in combat situation? In combat. Okay. In, in actual martial combat, you're fighting an enemy force. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be using the long sword in a half sword grip to use it as a spear. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going to use it as an axe or a pick for the yeah. keons. Uh, or or just plain holding it as a staff. Uh, to but this is going to be the difference between combat and what Hema is right now, which is a slightly more hardcore version of sport fencing. Yes. Even longsword. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. longsword. <laughs> yeah. And well, it, part of it is just longsword is so much fun. It's fantastic. You put it everything is. on and you can just start swinging at each other in a in a good way. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, even if you if you, if you take a, a different thing entirely, a, a, another complete context, mm -hmm. you have uh, equine horsemanship. Yes. And their biggest thing is dressage. So you're doing horse acrobatics. Well, maybe not acrobatics, but you're putting a horse through its paces. It's going through a set amount of things. You're going for excellence and execution. And that portion of the equine uh, community is going to have a look at like uh, Saran Saracen heads or tilting at, uh, at a pal as being complete gameplay because it comes really to nothing. There's not, you know, this is not at an Olympic level. Mm -hmm. Slicing up. Um, watermelons, cabbage, with, yeah, yeah, or cabbage is <laughs> is not an Olympic sport. Dressage mm -hmm. is. You have a lot of uh, a lot of excellence in that area, where you don't with Saracen heads and tilting at rings, tilting at appel. Um, you don't have that in the same way. You you really have to look at all fencing as some form or another of gameplay. Mm -hmm. which means you've got some amount of rules you're you're not doing it for for warfare purposes there's some rules and if you're doing it as a martial art well then you're not going to be doing a particular form mm -hmm. if if you're going to do it as a martial art you do it as a um i'm going to take my opponent out in the most you know in in the most efficient way right and uh, even then, you're going to have to use rules, and therefore it's now a game. Okay. Yeah. No rules, no game, um, lots of death. Yeah, definitely. Are there any rules that you enjoy the most? I mean, like, you know, in modern Olympic foil, you have to be the attacker. You have to get the beat touch mm -hmm. to get the point. I can't remember the exact name of it. But it's right something... of way. Right of way. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to win right of way, and you can mm -hmm. do that in a variety of uh, methods, but it's just like volleyball. If you don't win right of way, you don't score. Okay. And you enjoy that? Um, or do you like the free play more? Well, we can contrast that foil where you need the right of way mm -hmm. uh, to Epe, where you have a thousandth of a second, or a I forget a about how much it is, but you have a lockout on your opponent. Right. Um, and it's to the first touch. And unlike foil, uh, it's a full body target, uh, which is more realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, you know, have a look at Saber, where you're using much more of the sword. You're not only using the thrust, you're using a, uh, a slash or percussive cut. But it follows um, the same rules as foil with right of way. It does with well, actually, I'm I'm not sure if if uh, that is for the Olympic case. style. Yes. Okay, for Olympic style. Okay, there we go. But it also uses only the upper half of the body, right. 
waist to the bone. Right. So, you know, it's it's kind of choose your game. What mm -hmm. game do you want to play? Well, if it's you and I, we might be more inclined to do um, long sword than saber or do rapier more than foil. Mm -hmm. it, it it depends. It's, you know, it's a game and you choose your game. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the German name for it. I did it with Adam Franti. It was head only with the long sword. You okay. happen to know what that one is? What the uh, name of it? No, no. I don't know the name. So only cuts, no thrusts, head only. He was telling me about it, like the way that they would do it before in their clubs. Like this is Meyer's time period. Mm. It would be head only, no thrust, and if you broke the rules, so like you came in and I thrusted, hit you in the head, then I have to buy you lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um I don't want to play that because I would have to <laughs> buy a lot of lunches. Because Fair enough. I, I'm going to say, hmm, head only. Why don't I fence according to Meyer and have it be a full body target again? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. mean, if they want to, I, in, in Meyer, there are two crosses which divide body or body parts. Plus there's, an X. No, no. Oh. There's there's plus on, or there, there's cross on face and there's cross on body. Ah, uh, okay. So if you're and you, you need to uh, divide up your, or you don't need to, you, you can divide up your, your blows on, okay, you have a low rising cut to the leg. Well, mm -hmm. if you're doing face only, obviously that's out of bounds. Right. Uh, low rising. But that's the, the cool head. part about it. Hmm? That's the cool part about it is that you're adding these extra rules that it's head only and no thrust. Well, that if, if that's your game, yeah <laughs> go ahead and play it. yep absolutely and, and you know i i'm not one to say you can't do that yep <laughs> and, and there are too many people saying you can't do that yes there are you know, uh, but you know let's get into it. so let's get into some of that you can't do that where's my question i had something about well, you had the question of it about uh insurance and hmm. actually if you flip that sheet over i have the uh I have the exact thing, and, and it sounds like a scholarly title to a scholarly article. Rules versus no, rules versus ethics in the age of insurance. Yeah, sounds like the topic of a term paper. It, it does. It does. <laughs> um, well, if I have a rule saying, okay, I have to to score a hit on your leg, mm -hmm. I have to hit you with sufficient force. Yes. Okay. That's great. Well, especially then, when we don't have any way of registering that that hit has occurred. Yes. Yeah. If it if it's just well, there are other circumstances, but you know, just getting to, into this a little bit of a little bit at a time. So, I have to fit you, hit you with sufficient force. Yes. Okay. So it has to be probably more than an incidental touch. Yes. Okay. Which means if I haul off and whack you hard enough to rip muscle, that's not an ethical blow. Okay. Um, because I now am trying to take a friendly competition and do you damage. Yes. But let's take a look at someone who's not you, someone next to you, uh, that we we might have an idea of, of who to personify or not. Okay. And... Someone takes a sword and hits them a, a nice percussive blow, certainly something that can be felt, and they say, no, it wasn't good enough. Okay. Okay, well, why wasn't it good enough? And you could come up with yeah. any number of reasons for that. And, you know, pretty much it becomes obvious that, okay, they're saying it wasn't hard enough. Okay. Then a person comes in, same blow, hard enough to rip muscles. Mm. Now you've got someone who refused to take what anyone else would take as a good blow, and now they're rolling around in pain. Mm -hmm. um, there are two factors there. One guy who refused to follow the rules, and another guy that said, okay, if you're not following the rules, here's what you get. Yeah. Now... Obviously, the person 
violated the rules by not taking the reasonable blow. And the other person, did they violate ethics to hit them that hard where they actually took it? Because there wasn't any other way. There isn't any other way. I mean, there we go. And this is the uh, this is the difference between sparring and like a tournament setting where you're going to have judges and you're mm -hmm. going to have line judges watching. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some videos of Swordfish, oh, yes. uh, the Norwegian tournaments where they have four line judges with a flag, mm -hmm. and then there's the, I don't know the name for them, the umpire, the head. Empire, uh, head judge. referee. Yeah, the head referee. Yeah. That that was the thing that I was going to get back to, okay. where you, you take the, ha, you, you, have, you are inferior to me, therefore I'm not going to take any blow from you. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to what we said about the other. Well, obviously uh, you haven't put in enough time, so I'm going to ignore everything you do. Okay. Until you're hit way too hard, now you're rolling around in pain. Now, do you see things like this? Tell me how a, an SCA tournament, like top tier tournaments work. Is it honor system in that, or do they have a judge? It is completely honor system. Completely. The SCA Even is at the top levels. The SCA has well, more or less, has in its rules, and not necessarily in in practice all the time, but has in its rules where the person receiving the blow is the one to decide whether or not it's good. Okay. Um, which has led to a number of. Hurt feelings and, and yes, ambulances being called. <laughs> some ambulances, okay. uh, some lost tournaments. Okay. In, even in Crown Tourney, there have been, I'll say, allegations of people who did not take proper blows uh, that would have been good for anyone else or outside this sphere, uh, now, outside if, of this particular tournament. But in this, people are wearing armor, and there should be a ring. It, The ring of Rattan on steel armor should produce a sound that everyone watching goes he got struck mm -hmm. and those are not taken at times those are not taken at times okay uh and the thing is you know what what armor are you actually wearing a lot of it is steel mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot you know a lot of times those shields are actually steel so did was that the ring of the shield was that okay. the ring of of the uh, the leg armor or helm or whatever and yeah a lot of those a lot of the competitors have uh helms that are nice and uh nice and cur nicely curved okay did that hit at a glance or did that hit and stop well it looked like it stopped mm -hmm. okay was it sufficient well at that level obviously so there there are an amount of people ignoring blows. I mean, it does happen on a practical basis. Uh, there was one time recently where someone was told during the, the highest level, the crown tourney, oh no, you died. Okay. And it was someone who was famed for ignoring shots. And it's mm -hmm. like, nope, you died. Okay. Um, a crown tourney is for someone who is going to be crowned king by winning this tournament. Well, they're going to be crowned prince, and okay. six months later they're crowned as king. But yes, okay. they, they are headed to a crown, uh, prince first, then king. So you can only become prince or king by winning combat tournaments? By by winning the crown tournament. Okay. And that takes place in uh, every SEA kingdom, um, some most inside the U.S. and some outside. So... The differences between SCA and HEMA. HEMA is going to be much more sport fencing, while the SCA is going to be much more the culture. You're, you're trying to win tournaments to get a knighthood, to become king possibly, mm -hmm. um, to create your own house, get renown. Um, well, you you can create your own house whether or not you actually fight in the SCA. But okay. yes, uh, if you're <coughs> excuse me, no, you're fine. Um, if you are wanting those accolades, if you're wanting a knighthood, you, you need to bring up your game to that level. Okay. Uh, and you have to... Uh, there, 
there are other things too, but you have to bring up your game level to to impress the fellow knights. Okay. Uh, the knights are going to have a a look at potential people, and they will mm. suggest to the king that he knights them. Final authority is the king. Okay. Uh, he but can there knight several... whoever. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the, like like a jury can. A grand jury can indict a ham sandwich. A king can, <laughs> uh, can crown whoever he wishes. Okay. Uh, but the knights will get together and say, okay, these people are ready. Mm -hmm. These people need work. These people, why are they on the list? Okay. And just suggest they be dropped and maybe we look for others. And the SCA is worldwide. And there are quite a few kingdoms in the United States. How many kings are there worldwide? Oh, Do you happen to know? I have lost count. Yeah, fair um, enough. There was 12 for years. Now there's 15. Okay. I think there's less than 20. I don't know. I'm going to let that pop out real quick. Keep talking. Okay. If you can. Uh, I will talk if Come I here. can. Uh, but there's uh, there are also occasions where the uh, the knights will, in, in meetings to consult with the king, uh, I, I had heard with specifically Sir Stefan that there was a beating on tables and the chanting of Knight Stefan, Knight Stefan, Knight Stefan. Uh, so there can be insistence from the knights to the king. And the king, presumably, almost all the time, is also a knight. Okay. But there, there have been occasions where we have had non-knights on the throne. Uh, who's won a crown tourney yes okay yeah uh, in which case that complicates things for ceremony but they are they are you know people who were obviously at that level became you know won the tournament became crown prince became king and uh, are usually knighted shortly after they step down as king okay insurance wise SCA has their own insurance, I'm assuming, for yes heavy combat. And no. Yes and no. Okay. No, the the insurance for the SCA is for spectators. Okay. If you are a combatant and you get hurt, people will feel bad and you will get nothing from the SCA. Okay. Uh, it, it's kind of like, it, it's not quite like the Michigan Equine Law, uh, which says... I'm not familiar with that. Uh, if you were injured in a stable around uh, a horse, it's it is not the fault of the uh, place hosting the horse. Essentially, if you were dumb enough to get around a animal that weighs two thousand pounds and irritated enough where it kicks you to death, it's your own fault. Well, you are strapping on armor mm -hmm. and stepping into the list, and you know. So a SCA, yeah, SCA's insurance is more for protecting the SCA from those who would strap on armor, step into the list, get hurt, and still sue the SCA. Oh yeah. Okay. I the the first role of enter any entity as as well as people is to protect itself. Yes. So the SCA insurance is to protect the SCA and not people. Okay. Very good. I, I feel it's the same way with HEMA. The HEMA Alliance has their own insurance that they provide, but I, I think it's slightly more protective of the people than it is just the HEMA Alliance. I have not had it. You know, I would have to not... read the insurance yeah, policy sure. or have a lawyer, and I'm not sure if I can actually get to the text of the, uh, of the, you know, HEMA Alliance. Mm -hmm. and what if there is another Hema Alliance, uh, mm -hmm. another opposing organization? Yeah. Um, and they may have their own insurance with its own verbiage. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the thing about Hema is it it seems to assume a little too much. Um, and just in general, across um, the board, Hema. It, as far as I know, across the board, Hema. But Hema, you know it. It's in its infancy. It's yeah. still feeling things out. So there are a lot of 
really good questions mm -hmm. uh, that are not currently being answered. Uh, and maybe there are questions that no one has, not, not the right people haven't heard them. Uh, this is my fear, is that historical European martial arts as EMA will move much more towards United States Fencing Association territory. I know that HEMA is already, in its infancy, a sport fencing entity. You know, we're, we're sport fencing. We are fencing for touches, even in longsword. <clears throat> but to have a centralized governing body that umbrellas every tournament, every... Uh, there will always be outliers. There will always be individual clubs that want to do their own thing. But to have centralized organization with an umbrella of this is how bendy your swords have to be mm -hmm. this is how much they can weigh i like those things to an extent but when you're having diagrams of this is how bendy your sword can be mm -hmm. we have to think of safety first oh yes. you know our the safety of our partners has to be number one priority at all times but you know to regulate how many swords from what vendors can be used. Mm, that that does go a bit far. And it it go I, I have a problem with many things mm. uh, in the SEA that go into that granularity. Okay. Uh, it's great to give, okay, we need a dagger to do this. Okay, that's great. Um, then why are we banning these that conform to that? It's like, well, it came down to someone got scared. Uh, the whole switch from uh, which I was uh, peripherally but very much involved with. The switch from Epe to Schlager was a uh, horribly convoluted and somewhat unnecessary kind of thing. Uh, it, it should have gone that way on a natural basis, where we got rid of Epe's, which when they break can break jagged and go right through jacket. Uh, to schlagers that when they break, they break flat. Or some I have seen some that break flat with a tiny little uh, flange on them. Okay. Which uh, the the flange going to penetrate a jacket, but the whole rest of that blade with its nice flat break is going to get stopped. So somebody might have a few drops of blood mm -hmm. uh, if the worst thing happened with a schlager blade. Or a delta, or many of them out there, uh, but they're not going to go right through somebody. Okay. Uh, so the 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 whole thing with the switch from Epe to Schlager was a a fear driven kind of thing, and it was a lawsuit fear driven kind of thing, where you know, oh my gosh, as king, I am liable for this. Therefore, I must make things much more safe. And the day after I am crowned, all these swords are Obsolete. are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully, not. There was one person, uh, uh, my dear friend, and uh, person you'll probably not meet because she's trying to work on her doctorate and planning okay. to move back to Canada. Uh, Is she here in Michigan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, she uh, she works as an automotive engineer, and nice. is um, uh, an amazing. She she may not quite be a genius, but she's up there, uh, and she's good at what she does. But she she won the SEA three months of a uh, a phase in period for Schlagers, which they're expensive. That's not much of a period. Mm -hmm. She was going for six months, a six month phase in, and won three months. And people whine and cry that they didn't get more than the three months. But I'm sorry, <laughs> three months versus one day. Mm -hmm. there, there's not much uh, not much to realistically whine about but that was all over insurance liability fear of lawsuits mm -hmm. and uh, I I think there's you know those people out there that decide okay these other people they are not worthy enough for me mm. to take this sword and some of those people have been fencing at amazing levels for decades in the SCA. Yeah. And they will have their blow, blows ignored because they have 
Hmm. They have not studied this manual for four years. Instead, I will ignore them rather than these people have been fighting since before they were 18. Yeah. Uh, and, and are now gray. Um, it's a long time in pencil. It I'm is. jealous. <laughs> a little bit. Well, you know, hey, you you put in the time, you'll yeah. get gray too. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> my son is working on it. And my new family is working on it. <laughs> I've I've experienced they're they're, they're lovely lovely dogs. Yeah, you've had a Newfoundland Newfoundland. Before? No, no, I've had friends that have had. Okay, them. me yeah. me I I want forty seven Rottweilers. You want forty seven? I want forty seven Rottweilers. Have you ever had one? No, no. but you but I want. Dogs right now? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any dogs. But mm. with the way my life is going, it's best not. Yeah, fair enough. Um, no cats because I want to keep breathing. Yes. Um, How are you doing right now? Uh, I'm as long as I don't touch a cat and then touch my face, I'm fine. Okay. I don't think they're allowed. Let's see if they're okay. I, I think I'm safe. <laughs> so, winning versus teaching is the next thing I've got. Okay. Uh, you had a post on that. Yeah, and, I did. Uh, Please keep talking about that. You know, let the dogs in. Well, I have found that winning. Okay, winning versus teaching. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I I believe that if you're teaching, um, not only are you showing your students things, uh, you should have an active part in them employing what they, you've taught. And uh, I think that although you can't fence everyone for a sufficient time based on the amount of people you have, I fewer you'd be able to do some uh, some amount of uh, some good amount of fencing per person but I, I believe that okay if you're the one with the knowledge if you're the one that understands how to apply what you've just taught uh, you should go forth and and do that teaching uh, teaching is different than coaching uh, but yes uh, and it depends, you know, should you, should you, if you're teaching someone, should you fence all out? Should you go all out? And I don't think you really should do that. Uh, I think you should fence better than them. And that will help push them to that next level. Uh, if you fence all out, all you're going to do is discourage people. Uh, but if you if you fence with them, if you go to win but not by much, you give them an incentive to uh, to keep going uh, and to better themselves. Uh, I've also found that as I've been teaching, not winning is sometimes a good idea. Uh, there was one particular person who I was teaching who that I knew they were not performing to their skill level. And I was able to assess uh, that, yes, it was me. Uh, because in the SC, I had quite a reputation of being a top-notch fencer. They were intimidated by this. And I decided in, in just sparring to throw some bouts and leave some openings and let them exploit them and uh, because they were able to beat the renowned guy it got their confidence up that they could use just plain their natural abilities and they they rose to that next level and actually rose much more quickly and i only did that uh to that one person that one time and no he 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 became yeah, a phenomenal fencer. Okay. Just from that, just from me throwing awesome. fencing on one day. Yeah, and and I benefited so much from that because all of a sudden, I have someone that can push me, and and that's really what I want to do: teaching, uh, teaching and coaching. If if I if I get my toys up to the next level, my toys are much more fun. Yes. Uh, so I, that's what I want to do. So I always have a flexible idea with winning or not winning uh, you really need to 
be able to assess your opponent. Okay, what is their skill level? How can you push them? Where are you going to push them too much? Can you push them by not pushing at all? Like I did in that one uh, occasion with that one person. So that's something that you have to feel out. You have to have uh, kind of the cognition to be able to see what does this one fencer need right now. Yeah. And, and that's going to be highly variable. What they need now is different than they're going they're to need, need tomorrow. next month, yeah. tomorrow. Uh, what they needed a couple months ago, you know, you, you tried to help them with that one thing and they didn't get it two months ago. You haven't seen them since. Um, don't assume they haven't got it yet. So you, you need to be entering each situation with fresh eyes to be able to help the people out, get them uh, to the next level, get them to uh, you know a place where they should be rather than where they are. And uh, hopefully going to be able to do this where they have a maximum amount of fun because really that is the only reason why they're going to hang around yes. it's it's you're not, not like fun you're not why would you stay yeah exactly uh i mean a a marine is going to be fighting at a level and that's his job to be fighting mm -hmm. uh or anyone in the services is going to be this is my job well it's hema you, you are not earning money doing this. You do not have spending to do money. this. Yeah, yo, oh, yeah. You are spending <laughs> perhaps a lot of money. Um, but it's got to be fun. It's mm -hmm. got to be fun for everyone. And if you're teaching or competing and you're pounding on people left and right, okay, well, I'm glad that gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. And it's great. Winning, it's, it's obviously fun to win. But... If you, uh, you, you can, you can crush people doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. All of a sudden you don't have a competitor that could be a, an amazing competitor. Um, uh, I was, I was teaching, uh, in the early days of SEO fencing, I was teaching in three different locations. Uh, I was fencing in, uh, more or less Pontiac and Lansing and Detroit. And, uh, and I was able to get people in Michigan and uh and oh by the way Grand Rapids had a powerhouse of fencing also uh but between me doing the three practices and getting people to higher levels and the people in Grand Rapids getting their people up to higher levels uh in at the uh oh championships where we we're first allowed to do rapier at the Pensac War which okay. is uh held in pennsylvania in uh in early august usually early august anyway um we had a, in a 40 spot team that had like seven different kingdoms and a non-aligned mercenary so there were eight different places to draw from okay we had 11 people on that team michigan had 11 people on that team that is not a lot uh hmm? that is not a lot well, Michigan had 11 people on a 40-person team out of one state and eight different possibilities where you might want to have, if you wanted to equal, you could have a maximum of five people. We had 11 people. We had oh, so people. Had more. Well, we had 11 people on a 40-person team. Okay. Uh, and they, you know, the, the forces opposed to us had another 40-person team, but we had, we had 11 out of that 40 people. And um, most of those people, I had a personal hand in training. Nice. And, you know, I was able to feeling them out and trying to, you know, bring up their game, you know, got, got them up higher. And, you know, I, I cannot take total credit for, uh, for them being ah, ah, at that great level, uh, but I certainly had a hand in it. Mm -hmm. How many Pensics have you been to? Oh, I believe my last one, or my first one, was Pensic 13. Okay. And I can't even remember the number that we're currently Very at. Very nice. So, uh, it's up approximately, I don't know, could be around 50. Nice. 
I'm jealous of that. I, I actually think it's less than 50 right now because that put me at too old right now. So. Yeah. It's a lot of Pensix. Yes. Yes, it is. Pensix covers the gamut. Everything from heavy combat to rapier to siege combat. How do they handle that? Um, it's neat. It's really neat. You have a... Um, well, it, it's a... Uh, you have ballista. Yes. And you have catapult. Yes. So the ballista is pretty much uh, a bungee cord operated kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But you are throwing huge, great, big, long uh, arrow shafts at people. Uh, not a have regular. Have you been hit with one of those? No, 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 I have not. I'm sure that doesn't feel very good. I, I imagine it's irritating. Okay. Uh, and then uh, catapults throw a bundle of four tennis balls. Um, uh, but you know, you, you, if you do it correctly, you have a mass firing where it's not just fire at will, mm -hmm. but you, you coordinate, take, you coordinate, all right, fire. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, like seven arrows go onto one bridge and you actually clear a bridge. Very uh, nice. Oh yeah. It's, it's impressive. Uh, and I have uh, fought heavy in that before, and it's, you know, it's, uh, unfortunately I couldn't see it, but I heard about it, because there's a whole fortress uh, between them and us. And uh, I think that was the one where Sir Stefan and I we were fighting spears side by side, and specifically someone had been able to... Uh, crawl somehow without being seen along a line of hay bales specifically to assassinate him and take him out oh my gosh. uh and i was caught in that so we we both went down to that one guy oh my uh, gosh oh yeah it, it was it's impressive it's it's a boatload of fun um and we've only had one helicopter evac from penzik before um <laughs> It's a good record. <laughs> yes, and I've only been, you know, kind of laying down in, in an aid station only a few times or mm. several. You get whacked on the head? Um, no, mostly down from heat. Yeah. Um, and, Middle of August, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. And That's got to be hot and humid. Cold hot armor. and humid and a little bit of altitude, too. Mm. Okay. Um, and uh, former farmland, so when it rains, it's just bad. Um, well, you'll, you'll have wheel ruts from places that you can get lost in. Wow. So, yeah. And, uh, matter of fact, one guy, uh, he was right beside me and we were walking along mm -hmm. and, but he hit mud and not a little mud. So I look back and there are people kind of arms under his arms pulling him out of the mud because <laughs> you know he he does not weigh 160 pounds yeah. he's he's got 60 more pounds or 80 more pounds of armor on him right uh so start sinking fast start sinking fast wow yeah so and there are other dangers with that there's there are people who do not understand uh blood pressure who decide <laughs> i I will now jump in this stream to cool off. And they only jump in knee level, and that's all it takes. And they are face down in the water now because they have passed out. And lucky Start they were feeling dead. Real good, real fast. Oh, <laughs> too good. Too good. And, oh, man. you know, evac. Those were the evacs. Yeah. yeah. Blood pressure. Well, Heart blood, attack. blood pressure. He you know, yeah. I've been thrown in the back of a joke. truck before. So. Yeah, two strokes kind of joke. Yeah, I've also learned how to stay out of the back of an ambulance. Um, and surprisingly, bad jokes will help you stay out of the back. As long as you're Laughter telling them the to medicine. the attendants, you know, they, okay, yeah, we'll listen to you. It's like, and you run out of jokes. And it's like, okay, I feel much better now. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, you don't need us. No, and you spare yourself that expense of an ambulance ride. Because you pay for it. Exactly. Yeah. 
So Absolutely. I, I do have tactics to stay out of the back of the line, but they're not a good call. <laughs> Let's switch gears slightly. Okay. Get into more today. I have written here about April 19th, 1775, and April 19th, 1943. Yes. Well, I, I put that in there because it's one of the things that you would put down school shootings in the second amendment yeah. amendment um april 19th very and more things have happened on april 19th that are highly highly significant mm -hmm. um, but having a look at the second amendment and april 19th and the the two different years 1775 and 1943 highly significant and very much related um, yeah, get into what those individually are for those that are listening. Okay, well, first, 1775. Uh, that was, it was termed the shot heard around the world. Uh, that was where the British uh, came to confiscate weapons from colonists at Lexington and Concord. Yes. And people don't have a good grasp on exactly what they were doing exactly what they're trying to confiscate uh, they were not trying to confiscate. Yeah, they were probably purposely vague in what they were doing well no they, they were they were very direct on what they were doing okay uh, they were not trying to confiscate muskets they were not trying to confiscate pistols they were not trying to confiscate the the new latest and greatest rifles and all of these were flintlocks uh, they were not trying to they were not trying to confiscate any of those things. Okay. What were the British trying to do? They were looking for cannon. Okay. And the colonists had uh, buried and secret, secreted it away a number of cannon. Okay. And, you know, people, people think, okay, well, do you really need to hunt with a rifle? You know, nowadays. maybe we may nowadays, maybe we can confiscate this because you don't need this. And, you know, whatever people are saying, well, you certainly don't need a machine gun because that's a weapon of war. Well, what was the original intent of, you know, the Second Amendment? Well, what was the intent of the British? To come and on, take the cannons? They were there to either take or disable the cannons. And I know that they disabled at least three cannon. Okay. So these colonists had cannon. Cannon you're not going to use to hunt ducks. Uh, these are going to be used against government troops. These are going to be used against a fortification. Yes. Uh, and they were there to seize or disable these cannons. I think what they decided was they were they were only going to spike the cannons. As spiking the cannons, for people who don't know, you take a steel spike, you put it down the touch hole of a cannon, you break it off. Okay. There's no getting it out. Yeah. Also, you put additional spikes in because that will weaken the cannon uh, and you don't want to be around a cannon failure. No, cannon failure will take out a lot of your own people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they'll, they'll put spikes down the length of the cannon, just hammer them in, break them off so that they can't be removed. Uh, but if you spike the side of the cannon, it's kind of like spiking the side of a tire. There is no repairing it touch hole you could repair but uh, but spiking down the length of the cannon you can't repair that so these so the cannons, British were able to disable two yes. or three of these cannons yes and the colonists at this point were like we gotta go we gotta stop this they well, were taking away our ability to defend ourselves yes they were taking away their ability to wage war against a government mm -hmm. uh and what happened was, uh, you know, they they had they had disabled these three cannon. Uh, they were able to find where they were buried. So this wasn't just in a barn somewhere. These were buried in a cabbage patch, you know, and and in different locations. Uh, but they went searching specifically for cannon. They found cannon. They disabled cannon. They were going to leave. Okay, at that point. Uh, there was enough notice of the local people where they started taking shots at the British in a, a semi-organized fashion. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, and things didn't necessarily go well for the can uh, the the colonists either no. on that beyond the the lost cannon. Uh, so, but this was the yes, they're they're after our weapons. They have destroyed weapons. They will destroy your weapons that you have also. Now is the time to rise up, and yeah. that's what really started the American Revolution, and that's really what's behind the Second Amendment is we need weapons to defend ourselves against a government gone wild or enemy any enemy foreign or domestic yes. whatever that um, institution rises up as mm -hmm. yeah. well the the police the police by you know uh, opinion of the Supreme Court they are not required to protect anybody at all really uh, that yeah um, their, their motto is to serve and protect. Yes. Yes, it is. And a motto is as good a motto? as, as no, the... What's the motto of you? Know, you? <laughs> uh, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, it's great to have a motto, but mm -hmm. if the Supreme Court tells you, no, you don't have to follow that, are you going to? Then what is the purpose, in your opinion, I'm not sure what the law says. Do you know what the Supreme Court has said? The uh, I don't... purpose of police law enforcement is? Um, I don't think they ruled on that at all. Uh, they, ruled, the... they ruled that they do not have to protect and serve. And to tell you the truth, I have not looked at the opinion. What was the case leading up to this problem? I, I can't tell you. Okay. But you know uh, the verdict. You know the verdict I know was, the verdict. Police are not required to protect. No, not at all. What are they, so we don't know what they're required to do. Well, they're certainly not required to protect you. Yeah, I don't have internet on this, so I can't look it up. Oh well. But uh, we don't know what police are for. <laughs> they could be for anything. Well, now let's take it to 1943. Okay. What was April 19th, 1943? That was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Yes. That's where they had some pistols. They had some rifles. Um. Uh, they had some glass bottles and gasoline. That's yeah. all they had. And uh, and really, still at 1943, not, not much longer, but 1943, you've still got the most efficient military uh, known to the world. The German military. The German military. Nazi. Nazi. Nazi-led, Nazi, uh, Nazi, -led, uh, Nazi officers, mm -hmm. regular guys in attendance, but they're under orders. Yes, uh, and what are they to do? They are to round up these citizens. 500,000 Jews in this ghetto. I did a little research. And he okay. Told me about it. Mm -hmm. uh, 500,000 Jews pushed into this ghetto. Barbed wire surrounding watchtowers. Mm -hmm. And 6,000 a day were being taken to the concentration camp to be exterminated. Mm -hmm. And it did not take long for the word to be spread through the ghetto that people being taken to these concentration camps were being taken there for extermination yes and so okay no more we're we're going to fight back and, and surprisingly the the uh most effective weapon was the glass bottles and gasoline um uh, gasoline and oil whatever yeah uh and you uh you know they they fought back and they fought back for a good long time and uh, kept the Germans at bay, uh, even though the Germans got really, really good at house-to-house -house warfare. Uh, they did get stumped by the uh, the defenders in the Warsaw Ghetto. So, what what is what is the whole deal? Why am I bringing this yeah, up? Yeah, how does that tie into the Second Amendment? Well, you've got people, armed people, government people, deciding you are being taken out. Yes. And what are you going to do? Well, hopefully defend yourself any way you can. You've got some rifles, you've got some pistols, you've got a certain amount of ammunition, uh, glass bottles, gasoline, and oil. Uh, apart from that, you've got sticks and stones. Uh, bricks for, you know, start dismantling the houses and throw it at them a brick at a time. It's, you know, this, you, you've been marked for death. You're going to fight a whole lot. Yeah. Um, so how does that relate to the second amendment? Well, 
Um, you've got a government who decides you're going. You are going to be violated uh, along the lines of any human rights. Mm -hmm. You have a human right to defend yourself, to live. Someone has decided, no, not so much. So you you have to be able to protect yourself. And uh, someone has decided this, as in you're talking about like the Parkland Florida shooter, a person who is shoot doing a mass shooting, or do you mean government wise? Someone anything. has decided Either anything. One. Okay. Um, well, originally uh, courts in the 19th century, in the 1800s decided we we can't pass a law allowing you to do this and that and whatever with your firearm because the constitution has said to pass no law you know nothing will be infringed upon and if we say you can that's going to leave interpretation oh you can do that but maybe not something else so they refuse to pass a law in support of it uh, and unfortunately, that leaves it entirely unsupported. And people who say, oh, well, you know, some people have done some bad things with firearms, and so we're going to register them because yeah. we're happy, and this is Austria, and let's register all the firearms. And someone else does something bad with firearm. Okay, we thank you for registering. But now that we know who all has guns, we're going to take those guns. And they did yeah. in in Austria. In Australia as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and all of a sudden, now you're unarmed. You have no defense. Yeah. You have no defense against uh, a crazed lunatic who has somehow purchased a gun, or a crazed lunatic who's using a knife. There will yeah. There will always be the black market. There will always be those who are. I can't hear myself. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. There will always be those who are willing to do whatever it takes to get these weapons. Oh, yeah. Or or not. Yeah. Um, you, a truck. A truck can be used. So now, London is seeing this problem right now. Yes. Um, and they're trying to ban knives being carried. Have you heard about that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Knives and acid. Yeah. Um. And they have already banned carrying uh, katanas, uh, which people were, were using uh, for defense or for attacking people. Interesting. I didn't know that that was a problem. Uh, it had been, but it was quickly taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, no. no, he hasn't. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so anyway, you've you've got... Just one second. We're going to pause it. We've got to feed the dogs. Oh, okay. No, I didn't feed them much. Yeah, that's okay. I'm just going to pause this. Nope. So what dangers do you see in this day and age? Because for us in America, we have the Constitution. It's supposed to protect the Second Amendment right. And we've seen these different times in the past where people were not able to defend themselves and problems arose because of it and now we're at a time where people are saying there's no war there's no problem you know people shouldn't have these ways of defending you don't need a 30 round clip you don't need this gun that can shoot over and over again shoot so far you can't shoot a duck with that and i know lexington and concord 1775 the purpose is for even cannon. We have to have the ability to protect ourselves from enemies foreign and domestic. But people are going to say today, there is no reason to protect yourself from enemies foreign and domestic because the government has your back <laughs> and there's no problems. Mm -hmm. Well, recent events have, have illustrated really, really well that no, the police do not have your back. The police yeah. may be hanging around outside the school while someone inside the school continues to kill people yes. and they're waiting around outside. Um, and for, for 
there are no wars. No, there really, really are wars. They're continuing. They're ongoing. They're going to be around for now hundreds of years. Forever. We've um, been in Afghanistan and Iraq for 17 years now. Well, people accuse the South for still fighting the Civil War. And really, if you speak with people in Iran, they are still fighting the war against Alexander the Great. They, <laughs> the, if you talk about Alexander, they they will become enraged and start screaming that if they saw him, they would kill them themselves with their bare hands. Yeah, <laughs> and and they are still fighting this war, and it's been more than 2000 years it's been i, I don't know uh 25 3 2500 300 years that sounds about right <laughs> they are still fighting that war okay all right they there are certain elements uh from islamic countries that are now involved in war with anything western uh, and that is britain france mm -hmm. germany sweden uh, the United States, uh, China. There, there are Muslim terrorists in China. Yes. Uh, I believe the the Uyghurs are uh, are what they're Russia referring as to. Russia as well. I think that same. Chechnyans. Yeah. Yes, and uh, and that war will be ongoing. If everything goes well and we win and we put down that war, we're talking about five hundred years. Yeah. We we are now involved in a five hundred year long war and. If people don't like it, that's great. It's still going to happen. So we have, I, everybody has a, should have an ability to defend their own life. I don't think many people would, um, would disagree with that, but they would disagree on the means. And they would what insist, you, you know, that, oh no, the police are the means. Ah. It's like, no, they're not. They're they're not required to uh, to protect people. They're not required to do much of anything. And in practice, I, Parkland School, uh, they won't necessarily do that, or may not do that until they're good and ready. But there's also been training for police officers that all they really need to do is confront someone, and they'll drop drop the weapons or turn the weapons on themselves and that happens more times than not rather than a shootout shootout could happen has happened but most of the time confrontation solves so there is that danger but there is not there's not the immediate um drive to confront to protect and had there been a uh someone legally allowed to carry a concealed pistol in the school with the will to defend students done done that... at least there's a confrontation yes at least there's somebody willing to protect the students protect the other teachers yes and there was none of that in parkland there was none of that and as an illustration um as part of a former job that I had I needed to deliver a plan to someone in a Detroit school now that Detroit school has guards that Detroit school has a metal detector okay so on that particular day I walk in set off the metal detector the two two or three security guards are trying to maintain a rein on particular kids that are misbehaving and one gets out the front door they weren't able to stop someone who happened to set off the metal detector and yes i didn't look too threatening carrying a plant yes but um was it the plant that set off the metal detector i can tell you no okay <laughs> i i won't say exactly what had set off the metal detector but i set off the metal detector as okay. i went in fair enough um could have walked in mm. popped off all security guards mm. several of the kids i run down the hallway 
I take Why, care of everybody. So is this more of a problem with we have these gun-free zones, thinking that saying this school and all public schools are gun-free zones? Um, I think that's that's part of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think really, and, and a huge part of it, because there are gangs in Detroit. Yes. And they want territory. They want to make money. How do they make money? They are involved in illegal activities. They went from Detroit to Flint. Detroit gangs took Flint. Why? Because they didn't allow concealed pistols. But there's Macomb County, a lot closer to Detroit. The Detroit gangs did not bother with them, didn't think of going there. Why? Because if you wanted a concealed pistol life license, you got one. That's it. Because these Detroit gangs are going to carry guns regardless of what the law says. Yes. And, you know, if, if a uh, law-abiding citizen does not have a gun because And you were raised in Flint. Yes, I was. Yeah. Yes. Um, not going to live there now. Okay. Uh, and certainly not Aside going from to... just the water issue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the water issue can be you know, taken care of in a variety of ways. But uh, anyway, the, the Detroit gangs went from Detroit to Flint. Why? Flint, a concealed pistol free zone. The whole city. Well, you, if bit before the, the state law, and I haven't heard anything about how difficult it may be to obtain a concealed license in Flint, but <clears throat> certainly... Those Detroit gangs are still ingrained in Flint. They they're not letting go of Flint. Okay. Uh, there is still Why would they? a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. If, if there's if if all the decent people who would carry a pistol or were rich enough to afford one uh, are gone now because mm -hmm. they got out when the getting was good, mm -hmm. there's nobody there that can defend themselves. So why are they going to bother? Um, and, and that's one of those big problems with, uh, enforcement. And if the police do not enforce the laws, okay, crime will flourish at least up until the point where it becomes too overwhelming. Uh, but the thing is, if you can defend yourself, people who want to do your harm will give you a wide berth. If you give concealed pistol permit to, you know, anyone who asks for it in one particular place, uh -huh. well, it's concealed. Who has one? Who doesn't? Anybody You're think could. Twice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so those, you know, the, you're you're bypassed, and they'll go prey on someone else, mm -hmm. someone else who essentially has a gun-free zone a concealed pistol license free zone why not because and that's what's making public schools a soft target is that they are gun free zones yes and anybody who's willing to break the law is willing to go into this place to commit mass murder uh, because they know that nobody here has weapons to defend themselves exactly and you know there is a precedent for for school shootings and mass and much much more aggressive Mm -hmm. uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization developed a tactic of going into Israeli schools and oh. mowing down all the kids in a schoolroom. That's rough. Yes, but now there are two adults in every Israeli classroom with automatic weapons. Yeah. How many Palestinian terrorists go into Israeli schoolrooms now? Not almost none. None. Yeah. They, there is none. Why? Because they will die in a fury of bullets before they're able to pop off anybody. Israel also has mandatory mi military service for yes. everyone. Man two and year. woman. Two years. Yes. Two years mandatory. Uh, so they're surrounded by enemies. They have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, even Sweden. Uh, yeah. Sweden and Finland, uh, there's mandatory service. Mm -hmm. But there's also an automatic weapon under every bed. Yeah. As uh, long as you're a citizen, I don't know all the... The rules and the laws regarding that but 
you know, and now they've uh, reinstituted the draft because of um, Russian, presumed Russian intent. But, you know, if they're well, taking... they took the Crimea a few years ago. They took the Crimea. Yeah. They're, they're still actively there. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the Russian... Um, the Russian mercenaries that are doing the dirty work are pushovers, but if you don't have a strong military, you're not going to be able to quickly take care of them. No, Ukraine and Ukraine doesn't. Ukraine doesn't have a. a They're great... relying too much on NATO. Yes. Most of Europe is probably relying too much on NATO. Um, to a degree. I mean, there's France that still maintains a very, very aggressive military. Uh, some yeah, of they which... just got done bombing Syria. <laughs> yes, yes, they did, but they, uh, they're, they, they have. I, I don't think they've ever disavowed their global intentions and still. France. France. Goodness gracious. Yes. Well, you know, they're... changing topics from the Second Amendment, but please elaborate. Uh, well, they still maintain the French Foreign Legion, mm -hmm. uh, which is not allowed to set foot on French soil. Okay. Um. Uh, Oh yeah, I don't was, know much was... about the French Foreign Legion at all. Um, they um, they believe their own press releases. There's good reason for them too. Uh, they're they're a very aggressive force, but they're they're used as a um, non-French soil force. Okay. Uh, but they they still maintain a very aggressive stance. Um, France, I'm not sure France ever signed the uh, the non nuclear non-proliferation act and after the uh, atmospheric testing ban ban was in place i think they still did atmospheric tests of uh nuclear missiles nuclear warheads Ooh. that's have you seen that there's a youtube video of every nuclear test ever okay and it's in sequential order shows where the blips go off and it's nuclear bombs going off one after the other the united states followed by russia united or uh, united kingdom france india china wow mm. it's thousands thousands of nuclear weapons have been detonated on this mm. earth in the ocean in the air in the deserts it's brutal um it is it can be mm -hmm. um now they they always they usually tested for bigger and bigger uh that is not the case for arsenals there are more tack nukes than anything mm -hmm. else uh, although there are at least 50 maintained of uh of country killers oh, gosh um, <laughs> well both both the u.s and uh russia yeah uh both have you know 50 country killers each and waters have been muddied over the year with uh, the anti-ballistic missile treaty. I mean that we could we could do a weekly series on this for a couple of years just discussing the topics just for nuclear. But this are yeah. all arose for Lexington and yeah. Concord. Well, can I just mention Russia's newest ballistic missile, the Satan? I don't remember the number that goes along with it. You heard of that one? Um, I've I've heard a little. I haven't mm -hmm. bothered to look into it too much. It's some kind of anti-interception ballistic missile. Mm -hmm. It flies one direction and then the other, and for some reason this makes it uninterceptable. Oh, it's it's extremely interceptable. Okay. Um, it, just because something is doing that doesn't make it. Um that bad it, it just makes it a little more difficult mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like um stealth a stealth bomber uh stealth bomber if you're using current modern radar looks like a medium-sized flock of birds now please consider that this is an incoming you know bomber that looks like a medium-sized flock of birds flying nearly at the speed of sound not many flocks of birds fly at the speed of sound so no. you pretty much know what it is okay <laughs> is it target that flock you've got the bomber yeah so uh and you know obviously on a podcast i'm not t going to 
say exactly how to make it light up like, oh yes, this is this model bomber. But um, yeah. It's you have not, that knowledge, but not necessarily. <laughs> I don't have this knowledge at all. And I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist at all. Okay. That's why I mentioned it. Fair enough. <laughs> exactly. You have all kinds of knowledge that you're not willing to share. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and that's why I learn more things that I don't know. I'm willing to help. <laughs> In any way that I can help, please let me know. I, I didn't, I, I don't think you quite got into uh, the menu where you would learn things that I might not know. I'm not there yet. No, okay. Not there yet. Working on it. Lexington, Concord, Warsaw Ghetto, and today. Today is um, of great concern. Um, it Particularly, be... why are you concerned? Um, because I could tell you why I'm concerned, but I'm interested in hearing why you're concerned. Well, I on a defense aspect, mm -hmm. uh, I want to be able to defend myself, uh, anyone around me. I can defend a crowd of 50 with one bullet. Um, and if, if I, yeah, <clears throat> da, 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 da. um, you, it doesn't take many people to defend a huge amount of others. Mm -hmm. And if everyone is carrying concealed, who are those people? Right. Um, and it's, it's great to carry a knife and it's great to carry specifically a throwing knife, but you have limited range and you're you are dealing with moving targets. Yeah. So it's uh, it's better to be carrying a a pistol with a fifteen round clip. Yes. Uh, because if you miss with a target pistol, well, now you have to reload it. And if you miss with that bullet, now you have to reload it again. Okay. You. You, you were thinking from a common sense defender sheepdog even mindset though. The vast majority of people don't think the way that you're presenting yourself. No, not at the, all. And but why? Why do you think the vast majority of people think in a way that is no one needs fifteen rounds? If we get rid of fifteen, thirty round magazines, if we get rid of this scary black long gun, then we're not gonna have any more school shootings. Why are people thinking that way? Um, there are two reasons. Okay. Uh, they are unrelated. One, most people don't think or can't think in those ways, in, in those tactical manners. In, a, I, in it, tactical just... terms of defending other people, of defending the school, defending against a mass shooter? No, just understanding the mechanics involved. Okay. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who are not going to understand a from a security aspect because they're not taking the time, or they're just accepting what they're told. No, that's another thing. They're okay. accepting what they're told and they're conditioned. Even those people who can figure it out, mm. not everybody can be an ace auto mechanic. Mm -hmm. They don't have the mechanical inclination. Okay. Not everybody can be a foot surgeon or a hand surgeon and foot and hand surgeons really, really valuable. A lot of people desperately need them. Those are not neurosurgeons or cardiac surgeons. They're different skills yes. and they're different understandings. Well, there are still some people who are not going to think tactically. They could be great surgeons. They could yeah. be, um, Great this, great that, but they don't have the tactical savvy. But I think it's the vast majority of people who don't have the tech, the tactical savvy. True, and um, there are those that could, but there are those that simply can't, and that's mm -hmm. a life skill. And okay. it's a, it is a chemical skill that's been enhanced by some people by thinking through things, or years for decades um we we mentioned that i was at a particular event last night um i could pick out various places that would be good to have defensive snipers mm -hmm. um 
and was pointing that out to a friend of mine. Is like, okay, there. There's a sniper position. Uh, and there were some others that I did not include uh, in my pointing out because, you know, people get a little nervous if they're hiding and then you point right at them. Mm -hmm. um, Is this... Was this happen? Did this happen to be an event that you think snipers could have been around? <laughs> yes, yes, I really? do. Really? Oh, well, that's because you're at the Trump rally. Yes. For those who didn't know, this was before the podcast started. Yes. Um, yeah, being at the Trump rally, I'm sure that there could have been snipers around. Oh yes. Um, there were there there it was guaranteed. <laughs> there, there were guaranteed to be defensive yeah. snipers in a variety of places. Now, and were I could you pick them out? But you wouldn't necessarily think of sniper locations unless you had been in that situation. You were at a Trump rally outside knowing that there's more security here than we see the gentleman at the front. The guy in the plain clothes who looks like he's got an earbud in walking around. You know in that situation there's got to be some snipers around here. Oh, yeah. You, you, have, you, you know that, well... Many people would know. Not everyone would know. Um, Some people, it wouldn't even cross their minds. No, it would never cross their mind. Interesting, yeah. But if you have more a tactical mindset, you're you're going to think, yes, there are snipers. If you have a little bit more of a tactical mm -hmm. inset, uh, insight, okay, there's a good position, there's a good position, there's a good position. All, all of those positions are going to have pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be able to conceal yourself in those positions a little more this way, a little more that way. For yourself, do you feel that you're doing that because you have played with swords for such a long time? Because you've had such a martial background for fun, for the most part, do you think that that's trained you in certain ways? You haven't, have you been in the military? Uh, no, I have okay. not been in any national military whatsoever. Okay. Um, but I don't think sword work is really going to prepare you for, um, modern warfare, <laughs> modern warfare, mm -hmm. modern warfare, uh, very different, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, uh, it, it was extremely interesting. I, I knew, um, that the, uh, when the motorcade was coming up because there was a surveillance escort uh, in the sky. Interesting. So, uh, well, very interesting. Yes. It, it was, it was also very interesting to see uh, exactly where they went, when they went. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I kind of wish I'd been there now. Wow. <laughs> Well, when there's another one, you know, yeah. come on along with us. And there's yeah, like, absolutely. There's that, there's that, there's that. Just from a tactical aspect, seeing everything, how mm. interesting. Technology has changed so much, so rapidly. Yes. Uh, I'm only 32. I'm not sure how you, old you are. But I know that as you've grown as a man, as I've grown as a man, technology has just changed mm. so incredibly rapidly. And that stems from warfare. Absolutely. First oh, yeah. and foremost, because they get the best toys because they have to defend the nation. And yes. then it trickles down to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, drones, <sighs> robots, that it doesn't scare me. There's not much that does. But knowing what they're capable of and how much surveillance is going on mm -hmm. is staggering. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine how high that surveillance and technological level is around the president of the United States, around world leaders. You know, they are they are surveilled twenty four seven. Oh yes. In every way, every email, every phone call. Oh, Whoever and... they're talking to, so many other people are listening. I mean, I have a problem with it for myself, knowing how much of my Facebook information, how much of my texts texts are being read being filtered through with metadata but i'm nobody who cares mm -hmm. with the president of the united states of america he is under a microscope by everyone around the world oh yes absolutely and as much as they can in any way that they can uh they're going to try and get as much information as possible um uh, and and that's just casual 
uh, curiosity rather than a we're going to take him out now we have to have a look at the ground and be able to do anything uh it's hmm. it is it is both extraordinarily difficult and perhaps extraordinarily easy to assassinate a world leader um uh, and and that's why there has to be continu continual diligence mm -hmm. on just having a look at uh people significant people everyone that significant person comes into contact with uh which happens all the time yeah uh, i mean you have an enormous amount of intelligence individuals having a look in great granularity at people that you would not associate with uh with the president or any world leader and uh, that goes on all the time wow i i'm surprised that a pop hasn't been taken at trump i'm sure it's been attempted and we haven't even heard of it oh yeah i'm positive that people have tried to assassinate our president already oh yeah it's Un all, undoubtedly it's, he is such a hated figure right now well yes he's also such a loved figure and yeah. that is that is part of it if people were indifferent you know why worry mm -hmm. uh, but there is there's a lot of hate mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons for a lot of you know forgive me trumped up reasons <laughs> good um, pun but um yeah there's there's just so much going on we don't know uh, there there are huge amounts of uh i know of two but you know there there are terror attack attempts happening all the time in las vegas mm. lots of people high profile uh but they're you, and you get no information because it would be bad press for right. uh, a major tourist area to have that go on. So the higher it's, value the target, the uh, less you know. It's very interesting you bring up Las Vegas. That's something I'm concerned about because there's no information coming out about the big Las Vegas shooting. Well, and I don't anticipate any coming out. No, uh, nothing will come out until trials actually happen. But trials um, for who? The guy's dead guy's uh, dead he had accomplices possible what accomplices um you know, there was no... the uh malaysian woman um it, it depends on what she's already been questioned she's she... been questioned and released yes as far as we're we've been told <laughs> yes well you know they they there are several things there, there are several it stinks things. to high heaven oh yeah that's my I'm... personal opinion well yes it does but so do other things yes and um other mass I, I shootings can, other mass shootings other attempted mass shootings um you know just you know why are why are we having a um traffic jam at this time in this place well there might be two guys that are now have had a foiled uh terror attack and they're kind of ensconced under a bridge trying to defend themselves from you know SWAT teams um which also was the case in Las Vegas my goodness Wait, and where's this information coming from? um you, you can find what little information of that is available uh, things that are happening on... on the same day at the same time is what you're talking about well yeah it's it's kind of you know questioned I've been by by trying to find out things I've found out so much more okay uh, but you know I'm I for the two guys under a bridge that was also a Las Vegas terror attack mm -hmm. uh, details what little there are could be found on uh, reaganbabe.com okay because uh, she was stuck in the uh, the traffic jam at the time okay and that's the only way she knew anything about it was able to uh, report anything about it but you know when <clears throat> most leaks happen from local agencies yeah and when the local agencies work so much with government you don't hear anything because the vast majority of these local agencies you're talking about police agencies police agencies or i'm talking about the media the vast majority of media outlets are owned by single corporations yes. hundreds of local media outlets owned by single corporations mm -hmm. that spread the narrative and i hate even using that word narrative but it's what it is it is you yes. spread the narrative you spread talking points sound bites and everybody's saying the same thing across the country 
yeah, it's it's um, uh, um, it it sends. It's not an organized thing, but it's an understood thing. So everyone, nobody has to, um, uh, disseminate the new line, the new narrative. Mm -hmm. It's it's assumed automatically, and you you have, um. I kind of had a, a another little thought here, and it's unfortunately escaping me really well. Uh, but you you have those tendencies, so there doesn't have to be a conspiracy. So you can get a conspiracy-like thing going just by having generally accepted procedures. Hmm. And that way, you you don't have to have an organized. Uh, an organized propaganda campaign, an organized psyops operation. Uh, you just have an understanding and you go with it. And that's... That's the definition of conspiracy. Yes. You know, being a conspiracy theorist, I get flack from my wife for that. <laughs> but being a conspiracy theorist, I'm looking... I want to find what's underneath the rock. Mm -hmm. Because for every single thing that is shown to us by the media... There's 15,000 things happening behind the scenes. And there's so much more happening behind these mass shootings. There's so much more happening that we're not privy to. And mm -hmm. even looking into that information, the things that you find out, mm -hmm. hopefully they're true, but there's disinformation along with, mm -hmm. you know, the narrative. Yes. It's rough. There's a lot going on that we don't understand and we don't necessarily get to see. Mm -hmm. Well, there was there was one um, kind of joke, uh, you know, camping with a bunch of people. We uh, we had people who could um, fly surveillance for the right position to put up the bridge. We had the people who could put up the bridge. We had the people who could blow up the bridge and you know, potentially we had one other person who could disseminate the information that there had never been a bridge. <laughs> uh, so. That's a good it, joke. <laughs> oh, no, no. That, that was a camping event. Yeah. So no, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> the, dis the disinformation is that it is just a joke. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. There was no bridge. There was no bridge. <sighs> it doesn't matter if you walked across it. There was no bridge, mm -hmm. and you're just crazy to think you walked across it. You're wearing that tinfoil hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gary, I think it's I think this is a good place to stop. Okay. I'd like to have you back. It's fantastic talking to you, man. Sounds good. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I, I'll tell you something else that didn't happen ever. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it off and we'll have a thanks again for coming, man. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>